Okay, everyone. So we're going to officially go ahead and start um, our program. We are really excited to have you all here tonight. Um, we are going to be in conversation with Nicole Fleetwood, who is the author of the book, her new book, uh, Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration. And so I'm going to introduce Carl Dix, who is going to be um, our MC and our, our host today. And he's going to introduce Nicole and, and talk more about what Revolution Books is and what we're going to talk about tonight. So Carl Dix, uh, I'm really honored to introduce him. He is a representative of the Revolutionary Communist Party, and he's a follower of and an advocate for Baba Vakian, um, his leadership and his new synthesis of communism. Carl is a freedom fighter from the 1960s who went on to become a revolutionary fighter and a communist. He spent two years in military prison for refusing to fight in the unjust Vietnam War, and he emerged unrepentant and went on to become a founding member of the Revolutionary Communist Party, dedicating his life to the emancipation of all of humanity. And Carl is a co-initiator of Refused Fascism. He co-founded with Cornell West, the Stop Mass Incarceration Network, and he initiated Rise Up October that brought thousands into the streets in New York City in 2015, demanding a stop to police terror. So please join me in welcoming Carl and Nicole Fleetwood. So I'm gonna bring him on here. Bear with me. We're gonna get this thing started. Okay. Oh, am I on? Wait a minute. Am I off mute? You are, you're on. Okay. I wanna thank Emma for that introduction. And uh, look, I am excited about this event tonight. We have with us the author of the book, Marking Time, Mass Incarceration, no, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration. And not only do we have the author of this important book, we have two of the artists who marked time and produced art in the age of mass incarceration with us tonight. And we're going to talk about this. And look, this is a book. I just got a chance to read it just over the past couple of days. This is a book that talks about the process and the motivation for people who are locked in the dungeons of this society. I don't want to take too much of your thunder, but I have to say this about the book. Your people locked in the dungeons of this society, treated to suppression, brutality, and dehumanization, who grasp their own humanity and assert it. And part of the process of that assertion is the production of this art. Nicole's going to talk about it. And in the book, she situates that in a larger phenomena, which is the way in which this society reaches into communities of Black people, Latinos, Native people, poor people of all races and nationalities, and extracts them from those communities and warehouses them into, their, into the prisons of this society. So you're getting a larger picture. And in that context, the production of art and its significance, and you get to see a lot of beautiful art. So this is an important book. And Revolution Books is a place where this book should be, not only on its shelves, but it should be talked about, like we're going to talk about it tonight. It should be featured, because Revolution Books is a bookstore with books about the world and books for a new world. Books that help people understand the world, the way it is, how it got that way, but also highlights and centers a way that we can end all of the unnecessary suffering that this capitalist imperialist system is inflicting on people around the world. And the way to do that is through revolution, an actual revolution that overthrows this system and at the center of our bookstore is a leader who has forged a new framework for making that kind of revolution, a, the new communism that we call it. That leader is Bob Avakian. You can get his works here to help you understand the world and to challenge you 
to get with a movement that can actually transform it and end the injustice, oppression, and exploitation, and included in that, abolish the institution of prisons that this capitalist imperialist society needs for its continued functioning. So support this bookstore, dig into this event tonight, send in your questions. Emma told you how, um, comment thing on the Facebook and the rest of it, and sit back as we get taken on a journey through this topic of art in the age of mass incarceration by Nicole Fleetwood. Nicole Fleetwood is one of those intellectuals who came from the people, but didn't view that as an escape. You know, cause some people like they get out the ghetto <laughs> and they shut the door behind them and like they're gone from that. But Nicole came from this community, from among the oppressed, but she brought with her a sense that this oppression needed to be exposed and the people suffering it needed to be highlighted and centered, including centering their efforts to resist all that's being brought down on them. This book does that and it does it consciously. I'm gonna leave it to Nicole to talk about the how and why of that, but I want people to know that much about the book. Again, here it is, Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration. You can get it at Revolution Books Digital Store. You can't walk into the store right now. When we get on the other side of this, we're gonna reopen the doors of Revolution Books in Harlem, but for right now, we're gonna make the challenge of having to do it this way an opportunity in order to reach out more broadly, because this means that people from across the country can be looking in. And I was letting folks from Baltimore know about it and other parts of the country. So hopefully some of them are tuning in. Some of them told me they was tuning in. I'm going to quiz them about some different things about it and check to make sure. But let me just stop now and bring Nicole in. So I give you Nicole Fleetwood, the author of Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration. Carl, thank you very much for that introduction. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank the organizers and activists and sub subscribers to Revolution Books in New York and in Berkeley, because I hear that the audience from Berkeley is also here. So hello to my West Coast friends. I spent many years living on the West Coast. Um, and I also want to thank Raymond um, Lala. Did I say Raymond's last name right? Raymond Lada, is that correct? Because Ray Raymond has been in touch with me for years. I did an event in, st in the store. Um, in 2018, that was really great. And I'm really glad to be back. Um, I miss the space. I live in Harlem, I you know, it's my local bookstore um, and I like to support it. And I love the diversity of books and the diversity of, um, of, of people you bring into that store. So thank you for that space. Um, and I look forward, forward um, to a reopening. Um, I, I could not ask for better um, interlocutors tonight than Russell Craig and James Hoff, they're, they're two artists I admire deeply and as people, people I love and people I just, I want nothing but the best for them. And I could not have written this book without them and without the incredible art that they, 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 made, they, they have made and that they continue to make. So I'm really um, honored that they agreed to, to do this. They're both very, very busy people and it really means a lot that they're here to join me. And I, and I want to just say a little bit about the book and how I how the book um, started and um, as Carl, Carl, thank you for that introduction. I really appreciate that. And thank you for your years of activism and freedom fighting. And, and as you know, in the book, I talk about um, I don't talk about art and aesthetics in a vacuum. I talk about the I, I talk about art and aesthetics as um, intrinsically political and that everything about it, prisons are political, right? Everything about prisons is political. So you can't um, you know, so if there's to me, this is not a beautifying project. It's not a project to put, think about like putting murals in carceral spaces or making um, craft goods that then wardens can sell for profits, right? Because often I think when people think about art in prisons, they think about um, craft projects that in many ways are used to then reproduce the, the carceral state. What I was interested in is how artists in prison use the very conditions, the, the dire conditions of incarceration um, 
at the service of art. And as I was preparing for this, um, I was thinking, you know, the, whole, the entire book project has been for me about making art under some of the most austere and just horrifying conditions. And, I, and then it, it dawned on me 10 years later after finishing the book that it's actually making art because of, and, and art because you have to transform that world. That world is so austere and it's so terrible and it's so horrifying that art becomes a way of envisioning a new world. And in all the projects that are in the book, you see artists really taking the um, bare, barest of materials, um, the scarcity of space, and use the, and th their experience of time as punishment to create these amazing works of art. And the works of art also are tools, and people often don't, you know, they criticize art historians or critics thinking about art in utilitarian ways, but art made in prison also is made as this important practice of belonging. It's a way of connecting incarcerated people with other incarcerated people, with loved ones outside of prison, and to a larger community. And as you know, because you've read the book, I started working on this project through visiting incarcerated relatives. And noticing over the years art in the visiting rooms, also paying attention to like the practices of photography that take place in prison when you go to visit a loved one and you take <clears throat> a snapshot and you have that to take, you know, to carry, to go home with and to kind of remember that moment and, and how important and um, painful and vexed that is because it is a moment of tenderness and love and it's also a moment that's documenting the captivity of someone you love dearly, right? So thinking about it in these really vexed and complex ways. Um, through, through that process of just thinking about my family's own relationship to prison, I was able to make contact with a community of artists and allies, not incarcerated people. Um, I met Russell in 2014. Russell had just gotten out of prison. He was still in a halfway house at the time. Russell is now this world-renowned accomplished artist. He's finishing his bachelor's degree at Bard um, early in Bard's early college program. He is an art for justice grantee. He's the co-founder of um, a fellowship that's for formerly incarcerated people called the Right of Return through, through the Soze Agency and his, um, his brother in arms and in art, Jesse Crimes, they co-founded that together. When I met Russell in 2014, Russell said, you don't, you think I'm a good artist, you have to meet James Hoff. He said, James Hoff was my mentor in prison. James Hoff, and it is, you know, we are all so blessed that James Hoff is no longer in prison, especially we know under these, this current moment of a pandemic that is just destroying, destroying prisons. I mean, we're a prison in Ohio, Marion prison, 80% have tested. Many states are not even testing incarcerated people because they don't want to know the numbers, right? So we're, we're living in this moment where we're witnessing death machines, state sanctioned de death machines. And it's, it's just seven months that James Hoff was released from life without parole, right? And, and James can talk to, talk to us about that. And I don't want to say it's miraculous because, you know, it's, it's uh, insane, it's uh, obscene, that that was even a sentence given to James and that many are, even though we know that for young people, right, that as a juvenile lifer, that that has now been um, considered unconstitutional, that there are still people who are living under those conditions. In fact, someone who died um, in Michigan a few weeks ago, who was supposed to be released, he had been in prison since he was 16 or 17 and he died of COVID. Um, so, you know, it is, um, such a blessing for me that James is here and that he's able to have this conversation with Russell and me. So what I would like to do is um, show you some of James and Russell's work. So I'm gonna share my screen with you. And as I show you some of that work, um, I'm gonna just talk to you a little bit more about some of, the, um, some of the ideas that circulate in the book. But I wanna make sure you, can you all see my screen? Carlos, can you see the screen? Okay, great. I can't hear you right now, so I just want to make sure. 
Okay, so I'm gonna go through a series of works by um, by by Russell first, and and as I said, Russell told me when I met him in 2014, he's like, "There's this artist you have to meet. His name is James Hoff." He said, "James was my mentor," and he said, "James top James, you know, showed me how to do pastels and watercolor." And um, and James said something that Russell took out of prison, and it's to be undeniable. Russell, did I get that right? Will you not if I got that right? And Russell said, I aim to be undeniable. And I want him to talk more about what that me means um, in a few minutes. Um, so Russell's, this is one of Russell's first um, self-portraits that he did based on what I call a criminal index, which is his prison ID photo. And what I've learned through the book, and the book consists of um, uh, artwork and interviews, like 70 interviews with currently and formerly incarcerated artists. Um, one of the things I learned was the importance of portraiture by incarcerated people. It, it, it serves as a form of currency. Um, incarcerated artists can, are often, if they're good at portraits, are often considered prison rich, meaning that they are, are in much demand. Um, and, but portraiture is, you know, it's so important because it's a way that incarcerated people stay connected to their loved ones. They often will have a portrait commissioned of a mother or a daughter or a lover. Um, it's also important in terms of self-portrait because like with this portrait that Russell made called State ID, he was taking what the state has forced upon him, which is a criminal index that has tethered him to the state, that has forced an identity on him as criminal and has turned it into a work of art. Russell also said to me, he said, in the Department of Corrections, I found art. So he underlines the word art here. Um, this this is a this is another self portrait by Russell and it's called self portrait. He did that in 2016 when he was uh, still on parole at the time, and it's a powerful work. It work it's 10 feet by 8 feet, and it is you know four it's on quadrants where he has collected his prison documents over the course of many years. Russell narrates his story in just powerful ways about how when he was five years old. He called 911 to get help for his family, for him, and he ended up in foster care. And from there, he was moved into group homes, into uh, juvenile facilities, and then into state prison. It was a seamless movement through these correctional facilities with, with the foster care system being one of those. So after he was released, he's uh, uh, collected all these criminal indexes, these documents that tether him to the state. Um, and turned this into one of his greatest works of art, which is the self-portrait um, uh, on, on, on his carcel backdrop. Russell has also, since been, um, his release, uh, has worked on a series of portraits um, that deal with anti-Black violence and the criminalization of, of Black identity, of, of Black beingness. Um, one of his interests was um, with the court ruling that it's fine to discriminate discriminate against people with dreadlocks. So he thinks about the history of targeting black people based on their hair and the criminalization of black hair. Um, and this this uh, mixed media piece also is sculptural because yeah, which I love this. Ru Russell likes to use found objects. He uses that in some of his work he did in prison, but in this work he collected hair off of the floors of uh, beauty salons in Philadelphia, where he was living at the time. And he created these sculptural locks um, that he's affixed to his uh, the sitter here, the subject. Um, so this is moving into more abstract work by Russell, but it's still a type of portraiture. These are called evals. And he's thinking about the relationship between prisons and mental health facilities and the ways that especially young black children in foster care and also in um, criminal facilities are um, pathologized and forced to go through psychiatric evaluations. He, he was forced to go through that as a child. Um, and so inside the, what looked like kind of Rorschach test, um, images, he's put these abstract portraits of black people who have died at the hands of state violence. So like Ayanna Jones, for example, um, Philando Castile, and he can talk more about how he went about this work. And he uses blood um, as, um, as one of his, um, one of the medium on this, um, 
on these canvases. He's now uh, moved into doing portraits, thinking about re-entry and what does re-entry look like, especially for people who've been sentenced to life or have done really long-term sentences. Um, and so this is a series that he did um, with, uh, as part of his fellowship with Mural Arts Philadelphia. Um, his Portraits of Justice series um, is a large scale project at the municipal building in the city of Philadelphia, where he did these multi-story portraits of formerly incarcerated people, many who have become part of his own artist community, activist community, and who are friends. And he's going to tell us more about that. His, one of his most recent works, will, which will be in the African American Museum in Philadelphia, as soon as it reopens, it was supposed to open in June, right? Is that correct? is a collaboration between Russell and James Hoff. And here you see this really exquisite portrait, large scale portrait that Russell has made of James and of two other formerly incarcerated um, people uh, who will be, um, and these, these um, portraits will hang in the museum. And he'll tell us more about the context for that. But one of the things that I love about the friendship and the mentorship that um, has evolved between James and, and Russell is the way that they lovingly depict each other. And I think it, you know, it's a real, to me, it's a model of like black male friendship because often we, black men are afraid to talk about love and care, but your friendship has revealed the importance of love and care among incarcerated people, among black men as, as necessary tools for survival, right? Like you cannot survive if, you, if you're not willing um, to love and care for each other. And um, I, this for me is really um, just a beautiful practice of love and care. And it's a portrait that James made of Russell and Russell's infant daughter. And it was once Russell was released from pr prison, Russell was still on parole, James was in prison and Russell sent a photo saying, here's my daughter. And what James does is render it into this beautiful work of art, this watercolor inside of a letter that he's writing to, James, uh, to Russell. And here's another where he's rendered um, Russell's daughter, uh, for, again, from a, a photograph. Uh, and that, again, is enmeshed in this letter form. So I want to now show you some of Russell's, um, James's work, sorry, James, James made these works while he's in prison. So I want you to think about the conditions under which he's making these works and also the political nature of this work. So this one is um, how uh, Big, House, uh, pro Big House produces boxer shorts. I, I'm getting the name kind of, you'll have to correct the name for me, but it's, I got it? Okay. Um, and this is I Am the Economy which is all about racial and extractive capitalism um, and thinking about the various ways that people, ben, ben, people, entities, institutions benefit from captivity and punishment. And we'll talk more about that. Some other works, this is also um, a mural that James was working on while he was at Greaterford. James spent 27 years in prison in, in Pennsylvania. He'll talk more about the kind of artist communities he was involved in during that time. Um, one of the things I just noticed, I have to say, I just noticed as we were going through this is James, he's like, he's, James sent me this photograph from prison. James and I have been, had written each other for a few years, thanks to Russell who put us in touch. And I have to say, this is an aside, one of the, my very first exhibition in New York uh, that I curated was in 2017. Russell was like, you have to include James's work in it. Russell brings some of James's work, James gives us permission, and then we get written up in the New York Times as like one of the best shows of the week. And James's work is like, you know, on the front page of the art section. And he's, you know, in prison at that. And James wrote me and just like how, how, what a powerful moment that was for him. But I just noticed this in putting these slides together. One of the things that I love about this project is it's a collective project. This is not my project. And every time I look at it, I learn something more. Like I showed James as we were pre prepping this photograph and I said, oh, James, I just noticed you used that photograph right for this, at, right? As the, as the source material for this, self-portrait, right? And so um, this is portrait of Yaya. Yaya is James's, um, is, is James' nickname that he got in prison. And 
It's, it's, a, it's an honorific name because often James is referred to as the Buddha of Greaterford. He is just such a wise and, and thoughtful person. Um, and I'm gonna show you a few more works that he made while he was um, in prison. I, I love this series here. Um, and then this is a photo collage. So I'm going to now, I'm ask if we can unmic James and Russell and they're gonna just give us a kind of informal response to the book and having their work curated in the book. Um, and then we'll just kind of have a conversation that Carl will, whenever Carl's ready to interject as the moderator and the MC, we're here. So can you unshare my, uh, stop sharing my screen? Thank you. So can I begin with a few words? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I just want to say that uh, that was magnificent, Nicole. And I, I, you know, I'm aware that you know our work, but just to hear it so organized like that and this is just really amazing, really amazing. And 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 to speak to the book, um, um, I don't have the book on me. I left it in Philly because I'm just getting back to New York, but um. It was just remarkable how you remember things from years ago, like in detail, like, because I didn't remember you taking notes as we were speaking, but it's like, yeah, I, I forgot some of the stuff that um, we talked about or whatever, but I'm just really um, honored to be, you know, highlighted um, in this way and to be remembered because you, you um, basically captured the history, like the whole, when, when nobody was looking at us, you, you seen something, you know, and, and even beyond us. So, it's just an honor to just hear hear you um, ex um break that work down in the history of like how we would just you know survive and trying to just hold on to our 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 like sanity you know art was that tool and then you know we start having aspirations to do more and um you know we could talk more about that but it just it would just it just bring a smile to my face to, to hear hear that hear you break it down yeah yeah absolutely uh you know it's always an honor man to be able to kick it with my brother russell you know what i mean um right. uh, nicole as well you know the scholar you know what i mean you know russell i echo your, your your comments to be to be one of the uh the artists featured in the book is amazing um your book to me has the same electricity that uh dr alexander's book michelle alexander's book had the new jim crow you know, focusing on, you know, mass incarceration from the perspective of race and social justice, your book focuses on mass incarceration from the perspective of art and culture. Both are extremely valuable to the struggle. Um, and last but not least, you know, to be uh, here with uh, the OG, you know what I mean, the legend, seriously, um, you know, uh, Mr. Dix, you know, um, your work uh, as a communist and as a uh, person involved in the struggle, uh, against mass incarceration and police brutality uh, literally rings throughout every prison I've been in. Um, so you are legendary as well as Dr. West. Um, and just as a point, you know, one of the things that me and Russell, uh, when we were in prison together, um, you know, we would share experiences, a lot of positive experiences. And one of the experiences that we shared was Dr. West uh, had came to our prison, you know, our, the prison we were housed in, and gave uh, one of his greatest lectures. Uh, and we were both there, front row, you know? So, you know, um, you guys uh, have been, you know, like pillars of the struggle that we that we are engaged in as artists and as, as prisoners, uh, and now persons in society. But you guys have been examples and role models and, and continue to be as we move forward in these struggles uh, for justice and humanity. So, you know, it's an honor to be, to be on this platform with everybody. You know, so. Okay, I want to thank you for those props, but I want to throw it back to you and Russell, because see, here's the thing that, or a thing, because there were a number of things that struck me about this book. But I thought of, you know, because I did a little bit of time myself, some of it in solitary. And you're trying to figure out what to do with that time. You know, I was studying history and revolutionary theory, yes. y'all brothers were creating art. Yes. And you may have been doing some study of the, the same things that I was, but you all were producing art yes. that came out of it. And 
I just thought about like, they treating you like you ain't human in there. You know, that's what we were up against from the beat downs to the go here, do this, go there, do that. You do it and then somebody gets on you because they say you wasn't supposed to do it even though you just got told to do it. You're treated like you're not human. Yes. And you all were encountering that but not giving into it. And I just would like to hear from you like what motivated you to do this what obstacles you encountered and how you overcame them because that's the thing that came out of this book for me and this is the thing that people need to know because a lot of people are encountering obstacles in society and they need to have a spirit of i ain't giving into this shit. yes it's wrong and i ain't giving into it and then they need a, a, a conquering spirit of figuring out how not to give into it. And we can talk about that more. But I want to hear from y'all on that point. So, okay, so I'll go. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the prison environment uh, has its roots in American slavery. So, and that, as we know it, uh, was an entire 360 degrees of hell as a human existence. Um, there's no way um, that, you know, you can go up against those type of odds and face that type of uh, daily uh, dehumanization and uh, assault on your dignity as a human being and not come away unscathed. However, um, what we were able to do uh, was create art under those circumstances, as, as you said, as, as a form of resistance, as a form of... Um, you know, as a form of continuing our personal development as human beings, you know, so uh, the art making and the and the bonds formed within the processes of art making, you know, those those community bonds that we formed amongst each other, those brotherly bonds that we formed amongst each other internally and externally of the prison, you know, those things, all those things combined, you know, to create uh, a, a larger masterpiece that was a form <clears throat> of resistance to all the things that we were up against. And I mean, it, it, it was everything from, you had uh, officers and uh, prison officials that would literally destroy artwork, you know, uh, if they could, that would confiscate artwork if they could, you know, um, they, you had individuals who um, would put you under pressure uh, for the types of artwork you would produce, uh, if, it, if it contained anything that was deemed to be offensive to uh, the prison interests or state interests. So, you know, there was constant assaults uh, on, the, on the content of the work. There was constant censorship. And it was also, um, even for non-art making prisoners, you know, or, or just your existence in the environment, there was constantly, as you said, as you spoke well about, you know, there's, there's a constant um, a, a threat to your psyche as far as you, being able to realize your human dignity and purpose, you know, and there's a constant drumbeat or, or um, uh, a motion uh, uh, forced on you. There's like this heat wave in the prison system uh, that you're not human, that you're an animal, um, you're subhuman, you don't deserve rights, you don't deserve uh, equal treatment, fairness, or justice under the law. And, you know, you were sent here to be punished and, and, and most likely to die here. So, and everything that proceeds from that is is designed to break you spiritually, mentally, and and physically, you know. So, art making inside that environment is definitely uh, the strongest form of resistance that we were able to uh, to exact, you know. So, and um, I I add to that a little bit because you you took the bull by the horns and really broke it down, but like um, as far as myself, as I mentioned with Nicole, um, you know, the art was like a tool. To, um, to to keep our like sanity because it was like a um, a distraction from the things that was going on around. You know, James, he was, um, you know, had a, a long time there. So um, it was like a connection with the art, you know, cause I, you know, art has language. So when I first came to Greaterford, um, it was a brother, I forgot his name had introduced me to James cause I was just down on the tables um, drawing and I was drawing on a piece of paper from Camp Hill that was like uh, one of the papers that's a part of like, you know, the establishment, like not a clean piece of paper. It was like a, 
request slip or something like that because I didn't have any um clean piece of paper. So um it was like one of the things that connected us right there because James was already like making work like that, but he was doing it intentionally, like putting art on those papers to make a statement. I was doing it because I didn't have like the materials, but um, you know, once we came together, once that we had that common interest in like the art, because it's not it's not easy for you to just, you know, um meet somebody you don't know because like it's in prison uh, culture, you kind of stay away from each other. And that's that was my thing. I wanted to just be in my own zone. And I use art to just block every everybody everything out, basically like a tunnel vision. So um it was a um it was a COVID mechanism. So so um it was good to find like a a, a brother in that same like vein of, of thought, you know, and practice because he wasn't into no foolishness and then he just started giving me all kinds of advice beyond, you know, what I was thinking, because I just was passing the time and and not trying to be into no foolishness and just was a way to uh to just keep my 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 focus and and, and my uh my mind, you know. So you know, long story short, that's it, it, that was like it was just very important for, to have the art. Like without it, I don't know, I don't know mm. where I would be, you know. Carl, can I follow up with on on that with a question? Sure. Follow up question. Sure. And, and you and you, James, James and Russell, you you know this that part of like how I talk about like the conditions of making art in prison. I talk about like penal space, right? Like just that the the one is like the the built environment of prisons, but it's also like how prison structure, like your most intimate relations, spatial relations, like how you can be completely isolated, but you're still crowded and space it a space, right? So it's this this you have no control over your spatial environment. You have no control over where you're gonna make art, right? And then I for me one of the and, and it's all so deep in different ways. But one of the things that I struggle to like, because it's so experiential is the idea of punish, uh, time as punishment, which is what a sentence is, right? That your status, that you're living yeah. punishment yeah. Um, in captivity, right? And that every moment is supposed to remind you of that. Yeah, I mean- of Your punishment. But one of the things I wanted you, and please talk about that, but one of the things I, that Russell alluded to that I think really just kind of takes over the book is the, the improvisation, the experimentation with material, with using state goods, with using whatever you can get your hands on to, at the service of art. Um, yeah, I'll jump in there real quick because because uh, it's funny. Um, I didn't talk to James. We talk a lot, but we ain't talk in a while because I'm like all behind in my schoolwork. So I was like, I gotta get with you later because like I gotta stay focused because it's finals and things. But um, he had brought to my attention. He like, yeah, you need to uh, make some more of those uh, sculpt soap sculptures because I would take like soap and um, sculpt things and things like that. And he was like, you should bring that back and you know um, get back into it. And I'm like, damn, that's a great idea because you know that comes from our experience, you know, and um. It just was a lot of like um moments like like I mentioned the Camp Hill papers and then then um then James made the piece uh highlighting portions of the Camp Hill riots and things like that and it just was like this connection so it's like um is is you know it's smart for us to uh to make that work from that experience you know like using them soaps like that soap don't mean nothing to me about like out here that that's speaking to when I was inside and you you had limited um. It was limited, what I would say, when you was like, you have no control. It was very limited and it was up to you to to make that decision of what you would do with your time and space. So, um, like I said, it was like a, a breath of fresh air to have somebody that, that was thinking the same, you know, and beyond, you know, he was always reading all kinds of books and he just was very deep, you know, um, I didn't have any education and things like that. I just was like a survival, you know, so it was the streets and uh, I um, replace everything that I was involved in in the streets with like an interest that I had as a child and just got into that art. So um, every day I was doing some art, you know, and, um, and I, I think that's what made, made James um, take a liking to me because he's seen I wasn't about foolishness and, um, and, 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 you know, and I'm very appreciative, always will be. And that's why I always talked about him because he gave me them kind of advice to take even outside. But when we was in there, we just kept like, you know, pushing towards not just even making the art, just giving a better understanding. Like he introduced Hank Willis Thomas to me and then like to 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 meet Hank. And I and I know I was like weird and Hank out because I'm like, yo, you don't even understand. Like we was inside and you were like, 
like one of the, the goats, like, you know, like, and yeah. to be right here and you just talking casually and to you, it ain't that deep. I'm like, you don't understand. And also James was like a prophet um, to, to, to these things. Like not only was he giving me advice and, and mentorship, but it was like, he was like really preparing me for outside and saying this was going to happen and that's going to happen. And then when I get out and I'm all sad, like, man, I got to sell millions of dollars of far. I swear I had this idea. Cause like, I got to get him like a lawyer or something. Cause like, you know, they gave you life or whatever, you know, but Brian Stevenson helped, you know, pass a law to get him out and things like that. So I don't want to talk too much because this is so many layers to how like amazing this is like, and it's just crazy. Just a practical question. I mean, I'm curious in terms of time, like James, how, how many years had you already been there when Russell arrived? Uh, over 20, over 20. So by that time, you know, I had over 20 years in prison. I was, uh, I would be considered, um, you know, like a mid-level uh, serving prisoner, you know, because you had guys and, you know, you still have guys that have 40 years in. When I had 20 years in, they had 40 years in. So, you know, 20 years may seem like a long time, but in all actuality, you know, our system of incarceration, particularly in Pennsylvania, our system of imprisonment makes people do, you know, virtually, you know, their whole life in prison, you know, which, you know, 50, 60 years. It's not uncommon to see somebody that has 38 and 35 years. And, and, and as, as Carl mentioned, um, it's, it's like a, something, it's like a dungeon, you know, where people just, they're put there, you know, and they languish, you know, for decades, you know what I mean? You know, so it's, it's easy to accumulate decades uh, of imprisonment. So I had about 20 years of, uh, in prison by the time I had met Russell. And and if I may say it, it was fortuitous because, you know, I had spent uh, some of that time uh, mentoring other prisoners and, and um, you know, investing my time and energy into uh, in helping prisoners find their, their artists inside them, but also uh, in other ways. If it, if it was something uh, educational that I could mentor an individual with, uh, I was more than happy to do that. Uh, as long as it was no nonsense involved, you know what I mean? Because I'm, I had clearly began to understand what was going on uh, with the system of mass incarceration. And I said to myself that the best thing I could do behind that wall, um, besides uh, further my own freedom struggle, which was to get myself out of prison, the next best thing I could do was help other individuals on that journey uh, and help them you know, find themselves uh, develop themselves and then be on that pathway out of the prison system for good, you know? So, um, and with Russell, he's one of the successful individuals who really, you know, he has in a strong desire to succeed. He's very talented, uh, as an artist and as a thinker. Um, and he has a, a strong drive, you know? So to me, I seen instantly that this, this young brother, if he applied himself, he would be super successful and he has been, you know, he has been. Um, I mean, Russell told me, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Russell yeah. told me when he was at, in the halfway house that he was gonna be a famous artist. Yes. And that he was that money, uh, cause I was, I've always been like, since I met him, tell, <laughs> worrying about his money. <laughs> <laughs> like the big sister I am, it's like I'm not gonna have to worry about money. <laughs> you know yeah. Very early yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, long time ago, that was like a thing I didn't ever like worry about. Like some people worry about things and get um, content, right? So my whole thing was like when I when I was getting my hands on money, I just you know, and it wasn't probably the smartest thing, but it just how I just wanted to go about it to not worry about it so much. And 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 then it it went into the realm of like you know irresponsible but like it kind of I, I took some of the teachings of James and then I just like lost control you know my own self but just because he was it, like don't let the don't let the the money you know no, don't worry about the money that's right. I mean worry about the art to take care of you take care of the golden right. goose like me as the goose and you lay the golden eggs and stuff like that so it ain't like I'm gonna have an egg and hold on to the egg but right. if you got a goose to just keep laying eggs so if you take care of that art and you keep making the art that's and right. it has meaning and things like that and and you keep challenging yourself, you know, it'll pay off. So I'm just, I'm, I'm going to ask a couple more questions and then I'm going to turn it over to Carl. Um, you said something really profound, James, about that you were deliberate and kind of in dedicating yourself to mentoring other people coming in. 
Yeah. Um, and just, it, just one of the things that has been really clear to me from researching the book is just the importance of like the social relations that people create in prison, like yeah. that they can, that they can be life or death, yeah. you know, in terms of like the survival of people. Yeah. Um, and I know art was so at the center of that and that you were involved with Mural Arts Philadelphia and some other communities of artists. So can you just talk a little bit about the kind of collectivity that gets created in this in spaces where people have very little, right? And sometimes you find some of the most generous kind of spirits um, helping, you, you know, and we know prisons contain all aspects of humanity, like outside of prison, right? So, you know, but that you do, um, that art becomes one of the ways to kind of facilitate yeah. just new ways of being, practices and yeah. kind of new forms of, 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 of social relations. Yeah. So yeah, in essence, uh, in, a, in, in prisons, you know, collectivity can mean uh, survival. You know, people working together, cooperation can mean survival and it can mean, you know, uh, be a better environment, you know, for all for all parties. Um, so that's the macro picture, you know, uh, but the micro picture is for individuals, you know, uh, cooperation breeds success and, bre and breeds, you know, uh, better outcomes for everyone. So I had, I had to recognize that early on. And, and just to be, just to be perfectly honest, um, we were mentored to get to prison. So, you know, it was in a negative sense in a lot of ways, but we were mentored to get to prison. So it, it would only, it would only be uh, appropriate that we be mentored out of prison. You know, we'd be, we'd be, we'd be, we have better models and examples and paradigms to follow, to, to transition out of that environment and into a more successful life path. So I had, I had seen that early on and, and the struggle with me was, uh, trying to get other prisoners to see beyond prison politics and see beyond um, short-term gains and see the larger picture and see how we could transform our environment uh, to really produce more people who could be more, much more successful outside those walls, you know. Russell, I know you've taken on mentoring since you've been out of prison. Um, yes, to a degree, like um, with Mural Arts of Philadelphia, they had a guild program in which um, I had taught art a few times. Um, so, and then uh, it was kind of hard not having um, experience of like trying to get them to learn art and then also to catch the message of like, you should change things around because these these like young guys was like really, and, and a few females um, really caught up in the streets and things like that. So like me, you know, and and like, like say James, we have um, the interest in art. So it's like these young guys, they're very distracted and it's just unfortunate of, you know, their situation and they can't really all grab, there'd be a few that have the interest. So um, using art is that, is that too, to try to um, steer them in a different direction it isn't always easy. But, um, and I would try and there'd be all kinds of um, things working against you and people working against you and stuff like that that make it, make it difficult. So, um, but yeah, we still try because you can't you can't give up because what would be the use of like um you know the transformation and success we obtain if you can't help somebody else, especially like when you see yourself, just like I think maybe James seen um him, himself and me, you know, stuff like that. So you want to like pass it on, you know. So um so yeah, and then I also want to speak to what James said because that was deep and he, he never said it. I never heard him say it before, he just said it to y'all when he said um we was mentored to go inside. That's that's like factual because um, I had like uh, what I thought was role models and everything that they were teaching me was a uh, negative and it landed me like in prison. And, and that was the things we were doing to survive. And then it was like just being in that, in that negative space, it'd be times when you're not even committing crimes and police jumping out on you. Cause like where we at, it's just, it was just all messed up and they never was uh, pushing for you or motivating or giving you advice to get out of it. They wouldn't even want you out of it. You know, they, they would feel some type of way once you started climbing out, you know, um, crabs in a barrel kind of a, a mentality. So yeah, that was deep because um, that's factual. Yeah. Carl? Okay, a uh, couple of things I wanted to do. I understand some people have joined since the beginning of the program. I want to welcome you all to this and make sure that uh, give you just a little background on the program. 
We're having an author discussion of the book, Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration. We have with us tonight, Nicole Fleetwood, the author of the book. And I actually forgot to get into some of her bona fides. The sister is a professor of American studies and art history at Rutgers University. Her work has been featured at the Aperture Foundation and she was actually at Revolution Books maybe a couple years ago with a special issue of the Aperture Magazine as well as other places, the Eastern State Penitentiary Historic Site and the Zimmerly Art Museum. And she's also the author of On Racial Icons and Troubling Visions. So this is her third book and we're getting into that tonight and you also have the bonus of having some of the artists who are featured in her book with us tonight and talking about that experience and talking about what motivated them to produce this art. So I wanted to bring people up on what is going down here. I just wanna also just raise a brief thing. Cause look, it really hit me when uh, Nicole talked about the brother in prison who was supposed to be released, yeah. who passed away from the coronavirus. This is something, look, you're gonna have viruses, that's a natural phenomenon that happens. But when you have them in a society like this one with its savage inequalities, yes. there are people who are going to be more under the gun from that yeah. and we're seeing that happen people in nursing homes but we're also seeing it happen in the prisons yes. there are many prisons where hundreds of people have tested positive to this virus where people are dying and nothing's being done about it because they talk about well keep your distance maintain six feet of distance social distance frequently wash your hands with soap and water. You can't do that in prison. They don't let you have control over your life enough to do that. That's right. You know, tell the guard, right. well, I need to be six feet away from you for this conversation yeah. and see how quick you get a beat down, <laughs> yeah. you know, and they don't social distance when they beat you down. And we're seeing that even out on the street. We also have a thing where this government sent a lawyer into court a year and a half ago to say that keeping inmates in the uh, people in the immigrants in the uh, detention centers in safe and sanitary conditions did not require them to provide soap for them. Yeah. I mean, like, think about that. Yeah. And they're telling you, well, use soap and water to wash. You know, they say, we ain't got to give these people soap. Why? It's unnecessary. See, and a system that says that is basically saying, go ahead and die. Yeah. And, and see, when I talked about mass incarceration, police terror equals a slow genocide for black and brown people, people would be saying like, Carl, stop hyping it up. It's bad, but it really ain't that bad. That's because they don't know what genocide really That's right. is. That's right. But some people think of genocide and it's when they line you up against the wall and shoot you down. Well, that's only the last phase of a genocide. And we can even take what happened to the Jews in Germany. Well, they put them in the camps and gassed them. That was genocide, but that was just the last phase. What you need to do is look at the earlier phases of a genocide when they put you in a ghetto and wall you in. That's right. When they start demonizing you, that's right. justifying doing whatever they want to you, because right. they got to do that before they can get to the final part. That's and right. see, we're in the earlier part, but when you look at these people, and these are people in prison. Don't tell me they're inmates. Don't tell me they're criminals and all like that. Because some of those people are there just because they're black or brown, when you actually look at it. And when you look at things like how many people are in there just for drugs and the disparity in crack and powder cocaine. People are in there because they're black or brown. And right now, whatever unjust exorbitant sentence they may have gotten, 
is now being converted into the potential for a death sentence. That's real. And we have to recognize that and we have to act to deal with it. I'm not mainly going to go into that tonight, but I do want to let people know we're putting together a program that we're going to do online from Revolution Books. My working title is Mass Incarceration and the Coronavirus, a death sentence waiting to happen. Although I might say a death sentence being carried out right now because it's already, it's not just waiting, Absolutely. it's already happening. Absolutely. Pencil in Monday at seven o'clock for this conversation and sign up with Revolution Books. Get on the e-list, get in contact with us so we can give you information on who the other participants in that. I'm gonna be involved in this, but I'm reaching out to some other people to be a part of it as well. We need to engage in this conversation and we need to figure out what to do about it. Absolutely. The other thing I wanted to pose because this was the thing that hit me about your book, Nicole. A lot of it, well, the book itself was coming from the perspective that mass incarceration and prisons in this system constitute unnecessary suffering. And see, this is a thing that's hit me since back in the time of refusing to go to Vietnam, going to prison, coming out of prison and getting involved in the revolutionary struggle. What motivated me to do that is that I saw a lot of unnecessary suffering. That suffering has intensified. And so people need to be coming from, let's end this suffering. The thing that I wanted to pose, and see, this is what drove me into the ranks of the revolution, into becoming a founding member of the Revolutionary Communist Party, is that we have been aiming for decades to get scientific about how do you get rid of it. I mean, and we even have put together a constitution for a new socialist republic in North America. And again, people told us like, why are you gonna do something like that? We ain't got no new socialist republic. What does it need a constitution for? The point was to put out there the way the society could run how it could be if once we are able to get rid of this system. We ain't got no guarantee we can get rid of it. It's going to be uphill battle, but this is what we're aiming for. We're aiming to get rid of this system and to build a different one. And this constitution talks about this is how the society and the world could be. Here's how we could deal with these prisons. We could let a whole bunch, we could let most of the folks out of the prison when we make a revolution. With some other people, we'd have to orient them around, okay, society is different. We know that that dog-eat-dog -dog way that things were drove you to do some things that got you in here. Well, this is a totally different society. And there is a place for you in helping to rebuild and build a new society. And you can, do, you can be a part of that. You just got to get out of that dog-eat-dog -dog thing. And not everybody will get out of it all at once we can work with people. And I'm motivated by, I'm, I'm an old school, so I remember when they made the revolution in China, they had 70 million drug addicts. That's right. They ended drug addiction as a That's social right. problem, not by getting rid of the drug addicts, but by giving people a life with a purpose That's and right. working through how to get them out of it. That's right. This is something that we could do. I just wanted to pose that and see if you, Nicole, had some response, or James. Yes. Well, I, I would love to hear James and Russell talk about it kind of through their artwork. And I show, at the very beginning, I showed uh, on a slide presentation yeah. this work by James called I Am the Economy. Are you all able to see that pretty well? Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And, and, and James, one of the things I know about this is you made this while you were yeah. Serving life without parole. You didn't yeah. know if you were ever going to get out of prison at that yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, was, I, I, like, and, you know, this is like a, it's a really powerful critique. I mean, it's, it's, okay. it's from the position of I, right? It's deeply personal and it's really incredibly analytic at thinking about ratio and extractive capitalism. Yeah. And, and to me, I think it's just stripping bare. You know, one of the things that, that uh, art should do is from the artist's perspective, art should always strive to uh, 
hit a note of truth, you know, to, to find a, a, a the, the essence of reality and truth uh, that the artist is seeing and experiencing in their life, right? So to me, uh, when I would when I would filter uh, the American experience uh, and all these things that I was experiencing through prisons and whatnot, um, that picture represents stripping bare, you know what what my life and other others who are like me their lives represent to this system, um, which is system system that's designed to literally uh, convert you into some form of capital or cash or currency. You know what I mean? So. Um, and you know, in a, in a technological uh, world that we live in, there's there's many ways to do that. You know what I mean? So they've evolved uh, their methodology in doing that. Now, to get back to uh, what Brother Carl was saying, you know, he he brought up a great point that, you know, part of what I have always dreamed of is being part of a newer and different world, uh, and particularly in this society, um, and what I always kind of knew as an artist was that through not just creating work that could diagnose the illnesses of the country, because you see a lot of work that's representative of, you know, uh, what's wrong and what's, 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 what's going wrong in the country or works of tribute that show beauty, right? Um, I, was, I was keenly interested in how do we create the type of people right, particularly in the arts, but the type of people who would be part of the new society, who could be part of the better world, or as Dr. King uh, eloquently stated, the beloved community, you know, who are the people that make up the beloved community, you know what I mean? So we're talking about artists, we're talking about writers, we're talking about mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, cousins, educators, doctors, nurses, lawyers, etc. And what unites them into a beloved community is their commitment to a social contract, a new social contract that's about justice, freedom, fairness, and love, right? So any quality, you know, and to me, you know, that's as an artist, that's what I was staking my claim on. So, you know, a, a portion of the work is about showing and stripping bare you know, the realities that we face individually and collectively. But a, a larger portion of the work is really about how do we how do we work on ourselves, you know, to, to, to become the type of people who will who will create a better world, you know, who won't just wait for one, but who will create one who, you know, so to write a constitution before a government is a bold state, you know, that's a bold statement. That's that's how you do it. You know, that's you know, that's how it's done, you know, what I mean? because it has to be envisioned in the mind you know, before it can be realized in the world, you know what I mean? So, and our, yeah. friend, our friend Mary just posted a new hood order. That's what uh. she <laughs> And Russell, I, have this, I have the same question for you about a work that I showed earlier. And it's, you know how much I love this self-portrait. Yes. Russell, yes. Yes. it's yes. so powerful. A, a lot of people and like me, that. And it's also all about process. I mean, just the accumulation of all these documents that were part of the state's regime to punish you. Yes. Right? And then mm -hmm. to turn that into something else. Can yeah. you just, can you talk to us about the process? And I remember vividly interviewing you about this in your studio in Philly and you're like, yeah, I'm making us work, but I'm still not free. I'm still on parole. I still, I'm still on paper. Yeah. Right? Yeah, still, right? And so thinking still. about that paper in that type of way. So can you talk to us about it, about that work? Well, like, um, I guess the uh, the beginning of it would come from like inside prison, as I mentioned, um, like I would draw on pieces of paper when I was um, in Camp Hill and things like that, because I didn't have paper, then me and James, he would also do the same thing. So um, once I was released, um, I kind of got away from that, but then I was reminded once I was going to throw my prison papers away, because you hold on to them, because you might have to go back to court or whatever, but I was at a place in my life where I was like, I don't see see me going back to court or going back to jail, especially like for old cases. So, um, but you was like the criminal mentality or, or um, you know, it was just like a habit to, to, to hold these papers and things. So um, uh, I remember in prison, they gave me a box and it said uh, agency item, Russell Craig. You know what I'm saying? So it was like, really, yeah, it's really wild. So Were you like, an item? According to them, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? How did you interpret that? How did you interpret that? I was that? like, man, that's great because it was like when you first coming in and that's like give you your stuff, they put your stuff in a box, you know, and um, just like how the brother was saying, like, they don't give you that much soap, they'll give you some soap in the beginning and if you can't get conversary, then you won't be having soap like that. 
and things like that. So when that box will give you, you're like, here you go. You know what I mean? And you, from here, you got to make it. You know what I'm saying? It's an agency item. And that's also when I wanted to uh, um, highlight that in that piece that um that you brought. And thank you so much, that ID piece. And I'm, I'm touching on um, um, HB 9290. My number became my identity. But, um, you know, you still try to maintain who you are. And that's why I wanted to highlight that and, um, and take it the lot I needed this big and make it bigger. But going into all that stuff kind of builds up to to that um to that piece you talk about self-portrait. When I was in a halfway house, I did like a little version of it. And um and it was like, you know, done all quick. I'm in a halfway house. You're not in the best environment to create. You know, I'm breaking rules. They like you're not supposed to have as much art supply, things like that. So then um me and Jesse, uh Jesse Crimes, we shared uh um a studio in, in Philly. Like as soon as we got out, I met him and it was like um you know, he carried the torch that, that you know, um, me and, and James started. And it was just like, you know, um, or, or really James as, as like mentor, like he had a lot of art knowledge. We had that same vision of like wanting to you change our life with the art and things like that. So when he seen the little version, he was like, um, you should redo it. You know what I'm saying? He always got like, a, like, and like nine times out of 10, I listened to his advice, you know? So I'm just like, yeah, like, he, like it could be better, you know? So, um, and then, combinating with when I was going to throw my papers away. So I like, oh, I got more papers. So let me go bigger, you know? So um, use all the papers and just be done with them. Like, you know, if if for some reason I need these papers, I'm just going to not have them, you know? So uh, that's that's where the idea come from. So then I started thinking about um, the four different canvases representing uh, um, being targeted, like uh, like a crosshairs, because it was a, a rap group back in the day, a public enemy, um, Chuck D, Flavor Flav. So I was kind of like thinking of that and, and reimagining it as like being in a crosshairs, um, using the pastel in which um, James gave me my first set of pastels, like right around when we like first met. And, um, I never even heard of what pastels was. And then I did like a little Wayne picture, like like it was like probably next day or two days later. And I'm like, and he was surprised that I was able to uh, manipulate it and, and um, you know, control that medium um, with, 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 with like really no practice. So I used that medium, which I was introduced to me from the inside, um, did my portrait and um, because it's transparent, the writing is still there. So it's like symbolizing like, like here I am, but like this stigma of being a criminal is still like there. You could see the writings or whatever and whatever they is accusing me of in like the face. So, so it was just like, no matter what that, um, that I was feeling like getting rid of those papers and getting rid of that, you know, that, um, that label and that, that stigma um, of being like a criminal it remained so that's like kind of like what I wanted to highlight. And then my art teacher, my art history teacher from Bart just recently um, told me about like how when you're making um, big pieces of work, it uh, heightens the importance. So I wasn't really, that wasn't intentional when I made mine big. I just wanted it big so you could see it. Like, look what they're doing. Like, you know what I'm saying? So I was heightening the importance, but not really knowing. So, and, and that's where um, James and, um, and, um, and Jesse come into, like when I, um, obtain my bachelor's, I would feel as though I have like a master's degree because I already had um, professors with James and, and Jesse. Which you're getting at something that, again, I've learned from you and, and James and Jesse and Mary and Tyra and, and many of the friends we've, we've built collectively is that there's a rigorous art school happening inside prisons, yeah. right? And, it, yeah, it, and yeah. like, people are going to critique you have to come strong with the work, yeah. right? Big time. We was going home. Hard. Me, me and James, we was going hard. It was a few other artists too that he knew better, and I would, um, I would, you know, try to get pointers. But yeah, we, it was serious. It's like, cause that's what I did with it. I, I didn't lift weights, play basketball, play cards, play chess. I was always doing art, and I would go to him. He would be, he would be Yoda. You know what I'm saying? And I'm, and I'm getting all the, uh, all, all the Jedi. You know what I mean? Mind tricks or whatever. You know what I'm saying? As a young Jedi. Well. James? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, his praise is 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 um, you know, it's rooted in love. So, you know, um, it, it's always humbling to me, man. You know what I mean? The fact that you know he's 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 living in a he's living an amazing life, and um, you know, as well as myself, you know, a charmed life, and um, you know, I think you know, art can, art takes the the bulk of the responsibility for that. Um, our commitment and dedication to art, but also our commitment and dedication to 
um, really taking a chance on being brothers and, and, and taking a chance on a, on a new world. You know what I mean? On a new, on a new, on a new life. You know what I mean? Because there, you know, there's a, there's a nihilism that exists uh, in our society. And if you want to find the, the, um, the, the bleakest part of the center of it, you know, it's in the American prison system. You know, it's that's ground zero for the nihilism that that sort of lives in our society, and um, in that prison system, you know, there, there's it's all about uh, the norm is not to uh, associate and and become brothers and friends and really care about uh, somebody's existence. You know, there, there's this whole ethos of dog eat dog. You know, man eat dog, as as Carl Carl spoke about, and um, we we we. I know myself and, and, and Russell and, and several other brothers, man, we, 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 we dedicated ourselves to a movement um, to live in opposition to that, you know, and wh whatever way we chose to do it. Some brothers chose through art, some brothers chose through drama, I chose through visual art, you know, uh, some brothers chose through athletics and sport, you know, but, but there's a camaraderie amongst those men who choose to live in a way that is uh, embracing. You know what I mean? You know, not taking advantage of the brothers when they come into the system, trying to educate them and trying to reform them. You know what I mean? So we could send them home because even though I was serving a life sentence and Russell was not, my interest was in him multi multifold, right? Um, as an artist, as a brother, you know what I mean? As someone who would go into the society and, and found a family, you know what I mean? And, and be a role model, you know, in the community, someone that could uh, generate uh, uh, a job for another another brother or sister in the community um so i knew that the ripple effect could be great you know the more the more people that we can impact in our own lives you know that that will spread out you know that will spread out and and the laws of karma would, would always take care of me <laughs> you know uh regardless so I, you know, I never worry about that, but I, I, I truly worry about combating that nihilistic uh, pulse uh, drumbeat that that's in our society. And the way we do that is through expressing love and care for uh, the people that we embrace and encounter on our life path, whether we be in prison or in society, whether we be in a, in a neighborhood or on a cell block. You know, so you know that that. Once I became that conscious, conscious of that as a prisoner, you know, my, my whole thing shifted, you know what I mean? My whole thing shifted, you know, and it was over, it was a process, it was an arc in that, but, you know, it, 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 my whole thing shifted and it, and it made me see, you know, clearly, you know what I mean? That, that what we're up against as a society and as a people and what we have to do, you know? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if we've announced that we're taking questions from the, from the um, audience. Yeah, I wanted to bring us back. back to that. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to bring Emma in because she's the interface to okay. that. She also has something that she wants to say about the need for and how people can support the bookstore, including supporting it financially. So Emma, can you, uh, can you come in? There you are. Yes. Wow. This has been really great. And we have, so many people on Facebook who are commenting, who are really riveted by the conversation. And just briefly, I just want to um, talk about how special it is that we have Revolution Books. And we are fighting to save Revolution Books, to keep our doors open, and to also be able to expand these conversations in this new time of, of COVID. There's even more of a need for conversations like this, for people to find the books that tell the truth history that matters, and most importantly, a way out. And I was just very touched by um, what uh, James and, and Carl and all the panelists were, were wrangling with around it, you know, the, the hopelessness that people feel. And this is really the, the animating heart of Revolution Books is bringing people hope in a whole other way that the world could actually be. And so I wanna ask people tonight, um, if you've been moved by this conversation, join the Revolution Books community, become a sustainer of Revolution Books, um, make a donation tonight. We have um, a special right now for $65, you can get Nicole's book. You can also get a copy of Basics, which is a, a quote book from the talks and writings of Baba Vakian. It's a handbook for making revolution. And I just got a message that we're gonna include another book 
in this bundle. I'm just gonna pull it up really quickly here. Bear with me. So the other bundle that we're gonna be, I'll announce it in, in one minute what the other bundle book is gonna be. On that. I think I said to you off, off camera that, you know, like this is my local bookstore. I live here in Harlem and I'm, I believe in independent bookstores, especially now more than ever. And I'm very happy to contribute $100 to your campaign right now. And I'm hoping that our friends who are watching are able to contribute in whatever way they can. Great. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Nicole. So I think that that's the best fun pitch. That's a better fun pitch than I can do. So um, I want to tell people where they can donate. You can donate on our website at revolutionbooks.org. And then we are also on Venmo. And so you can, if you have Venmo, you can just send us a donation at RevBooks NYC. Oh, and then the other book that we have with that bundle for $65 uh, is uh, Basics, Nicole's book, um, and then uh, Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead, who, ju who just won the Pulitzer Prize yes. for this book. So congratulations to him. That's a lot for $65. Yes, That's yes, a lot for $65. So go to shop.revolutionbooksnyc.org and you can get your book there. And then also, if you want to be part, we need people to be part of this community to help with these events. To, there's lots and lots of needs. We're an all volunteer bookstore. And so if you wanna be part of the Revolution Books community in different ways, you want a better world, you wanna be part of this political, intellectual and cultural center of a movement for revolution, there's a place for you. So send us a DM on Facebook and we'll be letting you know about events and conversations. So that's our, it. Our friend Leanne Alexander, just uh, said she's going to contribute. She's a friend through Art for Justice. Excellent. Wow, thank you. So should we take some questions? Oh. Yes, we should. Okay, so if you are watching on Facebook, why don't you go ahead and um, if you have any questions or comments, we're going to go ahead and, and share them and have some of our discussion now. So let's see. I'm just going to, I will read. Um, I'm just going to read some comments and maybe that'll get us going. Is that okay? I'm fine with that. Okay. okay, so Julia said, I work facilitating art theater in prisons all around the state and I miss the folks inside so much. This has made me cry. Thank you for connecting me to my heart, my friends and colleagues inside. So that was from Julia. And then Leanne says, yes, keep revolution open. I will contribute as well. You guys are giving away so much. And Scarlett says, wow, I'm game. I'm just reading a little bit of the comments so people can get in the conversation. But if you have questions or comments, keep posting them. We're looking at the Facebook page right now. Um, and we're going to post them to the moderator. So we'll give people a second. Okay. Well, yeah. let me say somebody, this. somebody asked for the Venmo again. I think it's better, Emma, if you actually write it into the uh, Facebook live chat. Great. Just Someone asked for your Venmo account again. I will do that right now. Okay. And while we're waiting for the questions, I just want to say this to the panel. I, this is a discussion that could go on all night, <laughs> but we won't be able to do that. But I want us, I want to be in touch with you. I don't want to be it like we had this one discussion. It was good. And then we all go our separate ways or you all go your separate ways. I want to be on with people who came who were in prison talking about, what was the term you used? Undeniable? Absolutely. Because Absolutely. that's the spirit that people need to have. People are being denied on every Absolutely. front. And mm -hmm. Russell, and thank you for that, because Russell and James, what does that mean? And I mean, I know what I think it means, but Russell, you would repeat that all the time. That was your mantra. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually was, opened I, chapter one of my book talking about you. No, because it's really <laughs> about, right? Yeah, it's about really believing, you know, what you're saying. Like sometimes people say things or might know a little bit of something, but it's like, do they truly believe it? So within my heart, I was just like, you know, once I was leaving um, in prison, I, I kept um, a lot of the advice that um, that James gave me because we had some deep conversations. And then um, he was a little bit surprised of like how I never forgot about him. I always would try to... Um, gain some kind of success and then share it with him and also keep um 
being undeniable in my mind. I was really true with that. I did a BBC interview about five years ago and, and I threw that in there and it was like, that's how they ended it or whatever. And it's just like, you know, I, I just truly believed it that. So, um, and, and, you know, it manifests into reality. So, and, and, and you know, not in all aspects, there's still a lot of work to be done. There's always room for improvement, but, um, but things is, things is, 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 is really good and really a blessing from, from having that kind of um attitude like the brother said just um with that like uh motivation um you could just do so much because some a lot of people don't don't truly believe in themselves and you got to start with believing in yourself and you can believe in others and work together you know pull others when up when you get up and things of that nature absolutely absolutely and you know if i could just if i could add anything to that i would just say that you know um you know, historically, you know what I mean? Uh, um, we we are people that, you know, uh, and we come from people that, you know, if we settle for uh, present circumstances, you know, and not imagine a greater future, then where would we be? You know, where would we be? You know what I mean? So, you know, I always try to try to like instill that into the brother as I was as I was reinstilling it into myself that denials will come, you know, but they will be temporary. They will pass. Our goal is to keep pressing forward, you know, to keep pressing forward, not not to be stopped, to be undeniable, you know what I mean? To be, to be, to make ourselves, you know, um, as close to uh, perfection as possible, you know, and, and that's what our life journey will be about, you know, so in, in, in a personal sense and in a, in a communal sense. So because it, I could have easily adopted that as my personal mantra and said, well, that's just going to be the way I approach life. But my goal has always been to share that, you know, that not that, that I am undeniable, that we are undeniable. You know what I mean? You know, because if, if I'm just undeniable, at some point I'm going to be stopped. <laughs> you know, Father Time just going to stop me. <laughs> but, the, you know, the fact that we are den we are undeniable as a people, as a community, as a nation, as a human race, as a, as a freedom loving people you know, we are undeniable, you know what I mean? And, you know, the more of us that believe that, the better, you know? Okay, I see the a question. First, let me show you, these are the other two books that you can get in the bundle, The Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead and Basics by Bob Avakian, quotations and short essays from his work. And the Nickel Boys just won the Pulitzer, right? The prize. That's right, that's right. Congratulations okay. to Colson Whitehead. You got a question here. Question, did the artists get pushback or face repression for their art in prison? Yes. And could you say a little bit more about marking time and how art is related to marking time? Um, I mean, I, you, you wanna go? No, I was gonna let you go because you, okay, you was well, getting, you, the, no, yeah. No, I'll just, I'll just say that I've, I faced, I faced, personally, I faced like a bunch of repression in, in prison. And, and if it wasn't for, uh, you know, the spirit of, 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 of my ancestors and the spirits that reside within me, I would have been gave up, you know, I would have been stopped. Um, you know, I, I was, I was, man, I've been everything arrested, <laughs> took before uh, uh, various prison officials, lieutenants and captains interrogated about the nature of my artwork, uh, told to, to send the artwork home where it would be destroyed, um, you know, um, had artwork, had mutilated, you know, had artwork confiscated, um, and 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 not only, and so to me, when those things would happen, it didn't bother me. It didn't intimidate me. It didn't do anything to me. It didn't, it embolden me because I knew I know that I'm doing serving a just cause, right? Um, but what it did was, and this is what worried me, it would make the other artists and the other prisoners fearful, you know. So it was it was it was like a it was like a a psychological whipping that I would receive and then they would become fearful. Um, and, and, you know, and I would always encourage them to make work that's political in nature, to make work that speaks to, the, uh, to their lived experiences as men, as human beings, as African-Americans, you know, whatever lens they chose to see through. But I always encourage them to do, to do that type of work because yes, it will bring repression. Yes, it will bring, um, you know, some issues with the prison officials, but what it will also bring was two things. It would bring your respect because even your enemies have to respect you when you speak the truth. And two, you know, it would bring them self-confidence 
confidence and a fearlessness to know that they could stand up against the system and not be eviscerated, you know, immediately. No thunderbolt would come out the sky and hit them or, not, you know, so they, they could survive, you know, whatever the system was going to throw at them. You know what I mean? So, you know, but to me, yeah, I, I faced uh, a bunch of a bunch of stuff uh, about about creating work in prison that was critical of uh, of the system and, and what it's done and does to people. And as Nicole stated earlier, all artwork is political. You know, all art is political in nature. So, you know, to me, you know, I think the sooner we understand that, the sooner we will be using art as a form of empowerment. You know. And I'll say real quick um, to that, that um, in my experience, when I was inside, I didn't get much pushback with the art because I was doing um, majority portraits and things like that. And the work that I was doing wasn't really like um, having like a strong um, political or message like to connect it to it. I was, uh, you know, pretty much providing like a service of doing portraits of people's like daughter and girlfriend, mother, things like that as like gifts that they could send out and things like that. And then as I was doing them, like, and pastel and the colors and things like that. It was giving them like, like a, a, a nice quality of portrait. So I got kind of caught up in it. And James would uh, say to me, uh, "Your personal development is suffering because you do so many commissions." You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, um, so and even with, when when the guards would see me always working all the time, they um they kind of fell back from me. You know what I'm saying? It ain't like they like liked me or whatever, but they did kind of like um, because I guess like you said, your enemy um will respect you know, yeah. truth, and I wasn't giving, like, no, like, no heavy truth, but I guess I was giving him truth within myself of, like, this is yes. who I am, I'm just, you know, in my own world, just doing it, and then he has talent, I guess they recognized it, so, so it was, it was majority of, like, um, uh, positive, now, when I was in the county, um, I was going to court, and I wanted to show the judge some of my artwork, and the, the sheriff that was taking me there, this white guy was like, uh, you think it that you can make art that you like a good guy, you still a criminal. And he took my uh, art and threw it away, whatever. Like, but like, that was the only negative experience. Uh, and, and if I could just interject real quick, you did. I, now I do recall Russell. You that you know when I spoke about that nihilism. You know, I remember. I recall you telling me that you know even some of our fellow prisoners, man, would would just try to discourage you from pursuing a, a, a life and career in art. You know what I mean? You know that, oh man, you ain't gonna make it as no artist, you know, oh, that yeah. art stuff, Family. you know, so, so there's all, there's all forms of repression and discouragement that, that comes, you know. And Russell, oh. I quoted you in the book saying, someone had said to you, oh, you're not gonna make it as an artist. Have, have you, haven't you heard of a starving artist or something yeah. like this? <laughs> you actually- yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was like family members, you know what I'm saying? That's how crazy it get, you get crazy, you know? I ain't never listen to that stuff. Okay, we're getting a few more questions. We were supposed to go to 8.30. Can we go 15 more minutes? That's sure, to the I'm panel. Here. I'm quarantined, so I'm, I'm cool. Okay. All right, Emma, so give us the questions. Okay. Um, so this question, should I do the two questions together? Sure. Okay. So this one um, is from Joshua Martin Price, and he says, could you say a little bit more about marking time and how art is related to marking time? And then the other one is from Walton. He says, this is an excellent, beautiful conversation. Nicole Fleetwood's book is powerful and exceptional. Can she talk about the roots of her critical practice and how she's married that to her political vision across her three books? So why don't we start with the little more about marking time and how art is related to marking time? I mean, that's a great question. And, you know, I don't, I mean, some people are like excellent with like, they know their title and they just stick to their title. Um, for me, um, at, you know, I said the project started like, like in personal ways. And um, the very first thing I ever wrote about, about prison and, and art and visual culture was about posing in prison. And this is a photograph of me visiting my cousin, Alan, who was, who's no longer in prison, thank, thank goodness. But when he he was sentenced to life when he was 18, and that's with my aunt Sharon, and you know, and so I my I didn't know I was writing a book. I just started kind of processing this archive of photographs of visiting Alan and other relatives over um, the course of their incarceration, and looking at those photographs, I just thought this is how we're marking time, 
-hmm. And that's how it came to me was just through that. And then as I started to learn more about art made in, in prison, you know, I was looking at one drawing. Um, it was a crayon drawing that I wanted to include in the book and I couldn't include it because we could, for various reasons, we could not reach the artist to get final permission to use the work. And I got next access, access to the art through an advocacy organization, but I, for all the art in the book, I wanted, even if it was an advocacy group, I wanted the actual artist to be aware and give permission. And this was a case where we couldn't reach this person, but I had the image and you can see all the crayon lines. And I just thought every single stroke of that crayon is a marking of time. Yeah. I mean, it was just such a power. It was, it was just so um, over, it was like, as a concept, it was overwhelming as a aesthetic practice as a politic, I was just very, you know, overwhelmed by that. And, um, and so that stuck and, you know, we played with the subtitle, you know, some people don't like the, the framework of mass incarceration. We're, uh, you know, in, in the end for me, people, the, one of the things that matters, and this is goes to Walton's comment and Walton, I, Walton's a beautiful writer. He's a friend of mine, another professor. And I, I appreciate his kind words and support. Um, but I, I, what I've tried, and I shouldn't say but, I should say and, um, across my three books, um, I have, you know, the, the writing is very important to me and think, and so when people have read this book and they say, oh, that it's accessible and it's deep, like, for me, like, I always say that, like, the most profound person I ever knew was my grandmother, and I don't mean that, like, you know, you know, I'm sure everyone feels that about their grandmother, but like she would say things in the simplest and most profound way. And, um, and so I didn't want to use like, I didn't want a title that was going to be an obstacle to, for people to actually engage the book. So, so I think the title itself is quite clear about what the book is about, right? So um, I, I know that's not like a highly theoretical way of, of, of addressing how that that came about. Um, and in terms of just like uh, the vision that I carry across my work is, you know, I mean, part of it is I, I'm really interested in, like, I want to be engaged as the person who's exploring an idea like that, I, that I'm learning. And I say everything that's in this book is something that someone taught me. I was a student, you know, I, did, I, you know, I have a whole chapter on solitary confinement that people don't talk about that often. It, it's the most in some ways it's the most intense it's such an intense chapter you know it's and it's i feel like it's a we have so, such silence over that level of suffering that you know one person was in solitary confinement for 22 years uh, when the, i opened with a person who didn't survive solitary confinement um and so i'm writing about things as i'm learning and i want to write in a way that matters to me in a way that I, and I imagine what I would be as a reader reading it too. My son Kai Green is on and I want to say hi to Kai. And <laughs> shout out to him for watching this. <laughs> He's been very supportive throughout this project. So I think that was my answer to those questions. Other, do we have other questions or? You know, I think that we're, uh, Closing on 845. Oh, mentorship that for Russell and James, somebody else wanted to follow up on like, if they, if, the, if Russell, if you consider yourself a mentor, if people think the importance of mentoring, that kind of came up. Um, I, I try to be like to, to a degree. I always try to, um, to help um, any young brothers and sisters that I come across. Um, and I don't go heavy with it. It's not like my specialty. I try to um, recognize in them will they uh, listen to what I try to like show, and then I try to use my art to um, to you know like guide people or like you know um, highlight an issue or things like that beyond just like mentorship. Um, you know, just the people period. Because sometimes certain things get missed or forgot about, or we become numb to certain things. So I try to like remind the people. Like that's why I use the blood for those roar shark. Um, um, pieces that I did on the eval. So um, I always try to just start that dialogue. Um, and then, you know, from there, you just you just see what happens. So you hope that 
that you could be viewed as like a, a mentor or somebody that's, uh, that's, you know, bringing some knowledge that's beneficial to whoever. And James is definitely a mentor. So I'm going to answer that for him. No, no, <laughs> no. I was, no, I, if I could just interject and just say, you know, um, just to show you how life, how life works, man, life is beautiful in, in, in its essence, right? Um, although we, 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 you know, we go through hardship and pain on this journey, but life, life is very beautiful when it is very beautiful. And to illustrate that, you know, in, in this portion of the journey that we're in now, Russell has become my mentor, you know, so, oh, you, you know, get... no, he, he has, he has, Russell, it's true. <laughs> It's he, true. And I've he, seen you in terms of with exhibitions. Yes. With him, archive yes. of work. Like yeah, that's not no mentor. I'm I'm just, peer mentoring. I'm helping where I can help at. Yes. You know what I'm saying? No, he, he, he I appreciate you that. Learned. You and Jesse have learned together. So exactly. You, but people it's passing and for passing knowledge, right? Uh, absolutely. Right. And, and you know, uh, knowledge, uh, uh, modes of being, um, you know, um, confidence you know what i mean you know a lot of things it's it's um he has literally you know we, we've almost swapped roles in essence you know what i mean and the conversation wouldn't be complete without jesse i think jesse is 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 missing in this conversation but you know jesse jesse crime's role in this uh relationship is also very important um you know because you know and and i guess you could say in 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 Russell's life, he's he's had several mentors, right? And Jesse is absolutely one of them. You know what I mean? So, and 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 likewise, their friendship has become my friendship. So they both have become mentors to me. So, I, I, if anything, I, I would love that people leave this 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 conversation with the the idea that, you know, let's embrace each other. You know what I mean? Because you know. You know, you know how you know how Grandma used to say, "The same people you see going up is the same people you see coming down, coming down." Right? And I think the more we the more we realize that, you know what I mean, that you know we live in an interdependent world. You know what I mean? And you know, if we if we're helping each other, then we we won't be in, in as terrible a shape as 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 we could be, and I think COVID nineteen is sort of revealing that to us. You know what I mean? That we do need each other. You know what I mean? We need each other. You know, even if we even even just for friendship, companionship, and 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 and, and to be visible. You know, to be visible to each other, we need each other. And you know, I think me and Russell's relationship exemplifies that. That in the worst of times we need each other, and in the best of times we need each other. And thank you for calling Jesse Crimes out, who's also featured in the book. And Jesse is one of the most generous and kind, ethical, and, and also extremely talented people. And he's been at the center of really creating community among currently and formerly incarcerated artists, and really has committed his time since he's been released from prison to building community to creating access and spaces for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated artists. And so we all want to lift him up. He's here in spirit and he's on, he's on, um, he's live, he's, he's in the comments. So Jesse, we shout out. Um, and I know we're wrapping up and I just wanted to say for your fundraising efforts, when I search Rev Book NYC, it says no results on Venmo. Is that the correct, Emma? Hello, Rev can you hear me? Rev Book NYC is not coming up. Is it Rev Books? Rev Books. It should be Rev Books NYC, but I'm going to pop up on my okay, Venmo. I think in your Venmo, you didn't put the S. I mean, in the um, FaceTime Live, I didn't. That's Clark. Is it Clark Kissinger? Yeah, that's him. Yeah. Okay. I just want, is, can people see that? I just want the money that you're raising yeah. to go to the right place. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Rev Books NYC. And, the, and so if Clark Kissinger shows up, people don't have to worry that it's not, it's okay. Henry Kissinger's son. He is, <laughs> he is the antithesis of Henry Kissinger. He's a lifelong revolutionary, whereas Kissinger has been a lifelong... Warmonger, <laughs> mass murder. <laughs> Let's murder all of it. They're the antithesis of each other. Okay.
So thank you, Carl. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you, Emma. Thank you so much, Jesse. Thank you so much, Russell. Thank you so much, James. I know Mary Baxter is listening. She's our, you know, part of this community. Um, everyone out there, thank you so much for supporting us. Okay, and I, I just want to say, I really, I love this discussion. Like I said, I could go on all night like this, but we're not going to. Don't worry, I'm, we're going to close <laughs> it off. But don't be strangers. I mean that both to the panel, also Absolutely. the audience. Get hooked into Revolution Books. Get on our e-list. Follow us on Facebook donate to revolution books support this bookstore and be part of this bookstore community because we need you to solve the problems that the revolution is up against we're not telling you we got the answer to the problems and just follow us get with us and let's work together on solving these problems humanity demands that that's what we need to see happen so, yeah, well and beyond humanity the earth <laughs> demands that like, that's right <laughs>